Welcome everyone and thank you very much for clicking on my video and watching. I'm going to take you today through the stock market and how it also aligns with cycles. And this is going to be a look at the stock market for the layman and I'm going to show you exactly where we're going over the next seven years and why that relates to cycles. So it's going to be, I think, kind of interesting even if you don't know very much about the stock market. If you have seen my video on cycles, that is uh, part one of cycles of history, then you can relate to the cycles that I have explained in that having very large, those are very large cycles where the smallest is actually about 25 to 35 years, which is a climate cycle. And you have other cycles that are 172 years. There's an 18 and a half year cycle, which is a real estate cycle. And of course, there's the 515 year cycle that we're at the top of right now. So those you might think, well, you know, an 18 and a half year real estate cycle, how does that relate to me on a daily basis? Well, you know, it doesn't. But if you were to look at the stock market, and that's where a lot of us cycles people, a lot of we cycle people, people actually got into cycles was through the stock market because the stock market has got cycles all through it. And in fact, it has the number of natures, which are Fibonacci numbers and the golden mean all through it. So I'm going to show you how that works and give you an idea as to how predictable the market actually is. So let's get started. It's called Elliott Wave, actually. Elliott was a guy in the 1930s that came up with how the market actually moves. And so I do Elliott Wave technical analysis. I've been doing that for about well over 10 years. I think I've got 20 to 30,000 hours in the market just watching this. And so I'm pretty good at it. I'm working on a book and a course to teach other people how to do it. And so I'm going to tell you what I know about it and how it relates to the next the next 20, the next next uh, seven years. So if we were to look at, if you've seen my climate cycle or my cycles of history part one video, uh, if you haven't, I suggest you take a look at it because that will give you a good idea as to cycles. This is the main chart that I show in that video and it really sets us up for looking at the stock market. And so what this chart is, it's actually a climate chart. And this came from, all the data in this comes from the Greenland ice cores. They did some samples of ice cores in Greenland in the 1990s. And this gives us, they're very accurate, and this gives us the temperature uh, from, this goes from minus 2000 BC, or rather 2000 BC, up to today at about uh, 2000 AD. So it's actually a, a 4000 year span here. And you can see how the, this is going to be just a little quickie on cycles. You can see how when the temperature goes up and rainfall follows, more or less follows the temperature. So when it is warm and wet and we have lots of food and things, which is the top of all of these cycles, we have very large civilizations that grow. And as it gets dry and cold again on the downside, we go into something called the Dark Ages in most cases, another one here and another one here, which actually became the Little Ice Age. And so when it gets cold and dry, we get lots of disease and pandemics and all kinds of things. And all of these kingdoms or civilizations civilizations start to fall apart. And so that's what you are seeing here. And it gives you a good idea as to where we're at. Here's where we're at, actually. We call this the modern warm period. And it is not the warmest we've been in history, that's for sure. And you can see this. These are not actual levels, but they're relative levels. And you can see that it's been warmer before. And there are certain things that happen at the top of these cycles, which you can just bank on. For example, the amount of corruption. We always get a huge amount of corruption at the top of these. We, got a th we get authoritarianism, totalitarianism, uh, tyranny, weak leaders, a lot of fear, because also at the top of these cycles, we have low testosterone levels. And that uh, brings a lot of fear into the, uh, into 
into people's psyche. And, and so that's what you're seeing a lot today where everybody is scared of this pandemic, which is really not a pandemic. So it's interesting when you know about cycles on a grand scale, you can get a good idea as to when to buy a home, when everything's going to fall apart. And we're at the top of the American empire right now, which is going to start in the next hundred years to start to fall apart. And so that's the big picture on cycles. Knowing cycles, you can figure out where we're going. So as part of this uh, topping process in this very large cycle, this is a 515 year top. It's actually a thousand years from here to here. So that it's also the top of a, a thousand and thirty year cycle. And that was uh, 2007. We had the top of the cycle. And I'm going to t t talk a little bit about the how the stock market plays into that. But first, let's take a look at where this all started. It actually started a lot earlier than Edward Dewey, but Edward Dewey, I think of as the father of cycles. He began the foundation for the study of cycles, which I was the executive director of for about a year in about 2015, 16 in that area. Now, Edward Dewey uh, died in about 1978, but most of his work was done in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. And he used to work in the 19, well, 1929, 30 for Hoover, for President Hoover in the Great Depression. And when Hoover got out of office, which was in 1930 was the end of his term, then he talked to Dewey and said, well, it'd be really good to find out why they had so many depressions. Because in the 1800s, they had about six of them in the row. And in 1929, of course, that was the really big one. So what Dewey did is he went to work and he spent the rest of his life figuring out the cycles. And he figured, he found about 3,500 different cycles and he wrote a number of books. And these are great books if you're interested in finding out more about cycles. They're very well written in terms of easy reads and they give you a tremendous amount of information. And cycles go through everything in, everything that happens on Earth. For example, there are even cycles in animals like the Canadian lynx. There's a nine and a half year cycle and every nine and a half years the population drops right off. <laughs> and I think it's kind of funny that there were about three or four years ago when I got into this they had a Canadian contingent, I guess some scientists, that were paid large amounts of money to go out and figure out why the lynx population was so low. <laughs> well, we've known that for a hundred years. <laughs> but isn't that typical? Nobody looks at history. Nobody looks at the past. They all think that uh, everything they're doing is absolutely new and has never been thought through before. There's also the Atlantic salmon, which has the same cycle, a nine and a half year cycle, it dies out every nine and a half years. There are the lemmings that have a three and a half year cycle and they're in Norway and what they do is their population rises every three and a half years and they eat everything in sight and end up uh, down at the ocean and a lot of them dr drown because they're just out of food and they're trying to find more food and that happens every three and a half years and there are always enough left to create a new population after that. So we always refer to people that uh, follow along and uh, don't even think about where they're going, of course, as lemmings. So all of that came out of his work. And of course, he, he found an awful lot of cycles for business as well, and cycles that some of the other luminaries also found in later, t later dates later times, like this gentleman, which I talked about a lot if you looked at the Cycles of History Part 1, and I'm in the midst of getting Part 2 out. It, these things take an awful lot of time to put together all the visuals. So that's coming uh, very shortly. But Dr. Raymond H. Wheeler, again, uh, early part of this, of the 1900s, 1892 to 1961, and he was a PhD at the University of Kansas. He spent most of his life, he was a, a PhD in psychology, and he got really interested in, in sort of mid-range in his career while he was at the university in figuring out climate and how people were affected by climate. And here he is with his big book, and what he did is in this big book, he recorded all of the temperature and rainfall data that he got from tree rings. And that was an exhaustive study, and he had 200 people working for him, and he put them in this large book he called the Big Book, which is actually sitting down at Baruch College in, <clears throat> in Manhattan in New York City. It took me 
two years to uh, actually track it down because so nobody knew where it got to. And he did a, a lot, an awful lot of writing. But a lot of my work comes from his work because he did so much in terms of writing down both temperature and rainfall and then all of the major events from 600 BC all the way up till about 1942 was I think the last date he died in 1961 but what happens with all of those events is you can see that the events come back again at, at the top of each cycle so you can actually determine traits of society based on the cycles and what's going to happen and there's periodicity to the cycles meaning that you can predict the tops of them in terms of time. So he decided, he found out that there was a 25 to 35 year climate cycle and then a 100 year cycle, then 172 years, and then 515 and 10, 1030. So just like other people, and there's a book by Stephen Pitts who lives in Hawaii, which is in the, he put out a book in the 1990s called the Unified Cycle Theory, which he did all of the probabilities based on the cycle, the cycle periodicities, like the 172 year, and, and uh, there's some other ones, 18 and a half years, and, and a number of different cycles. And so he found that the probability of these cycles being off is like less than 1%. And so he's gone right back through history and done a lot of work in these cycles. So cycles are real. And I have been following for them for some time, and we're going through a time right now in history, which is a major turning point where we're going to, we call it the Great Awakening, and he actually called it that in those days, back in the 1930s, and this has all been predicted. 2007 was the top, and you're going to find out what I'm going to show you is there's also cycles in the stock market, because the stock market is very predictable, just like the cycles. Now, humankind can change the timing a little bit, but it always, Mother Nature always wins in the end, and the cycle eventually sort of snaps back into place, and you can see that particularly with the stock market that we have today. Here is the gentleman I'm going to share the work of, which is, and, and show you where the stock market is coming from, because, you know, it's interesting that all these luminaries that did all of this scientific work were in the 1930s and 1940s. That's when a lot of it got done. So it was after the after the depression or in the middle of the depression and afterwards after the stock market crash you tend to get an awful lot of science that comes out of these periods and now we have a much bigger cycle top that we're at that was about a half cycle 1929 it was about 92 years and if you put them both together if you multiply them you get about 100 and 180, uh, roughly 172. This cycle that we're in right now is a little bit longer because the top was 2007, but we're just seeing the top now because those good old central bankers have screwed up everything by putting almost a trillion dollars into the economy, and in, not actually into the economy, into the banking system in 2007. And, and that's created one extra wave up in the market. And we call that a B wave, and I'm going to get to that shortly. But Nelson Elliott uh, died in about 1948, and he came up with the Elliott wave. Uh, he calls it the Elliott wave theory. There's a book called The Elliott Wave Principle, which took his work. This is his original work, the masterworks of, of Elliott. And like a science, science is just people, other people sort of take them over and prove and disprove certain elements. And uh, Prechter, Bob Prechter and A.J. Frost, who was, who was a, um, an economist, wrote a book in the 1960s, I think the first version came out, and there have been other versions as well, that really took all of Eliot's war work and put it in a very easy to understand manner. Now there are some problems and issues with some of the things in this book, and I, through my 30,000 hours in the market, have found out all of the issues, and I'm trying to put together a course and a book um, on the principles so that people 
get something that they can work with that is trust is trusted so you so you can use it over and over again when you get errors in a book it makes things uh, difficult in terms of making money because you tend to do the same errors over and over again anyway i'm going to take you through some of this and show you his basic principle on the market and then i'm going to go and look at the market itself and tell you where it's going over the next seven years so here are here's the basis of elliot's work he found out that a trend, the market trend, the direction that it goes in for a very long period, travels in five waves. And you can see them here. One, two, three, four, five. And there are certain rules to determining whether it actually is a trend. For example, of the five waves, the fourth wave can never overlap the first wave here. It can't come down that far so that it actually overlaps this wave. There are some other rules that determine it, and one of the reasons I, I say that when it's the most important one is that a counter trend moves in three waves, all right? So five waves is the trend, three waves is a counter trend. If you have a, a wave four that overlaps the first wave, then all of a sudden you have to count this as a corrective wave or you count it as a three, which means it's a counter trend. So it's very important that you do not have the fourth wave in the area of the first. The market is also fractal. In a trend, there are five waves within the first wave. The second wave being a corrective wave like this one is in three waves, we call that, we write that as an ABC in letters and the trend waves we write in numerals one two three four five so there's your third wave and then you have another fourth wave as a as a um, an abc corrective wave and then you have another five waves up and then you have a major correction which always goes back to the area of the previous fourth and so that's five waves of the trend three waves back and then you will have another five waves after that so so this is how you trade the market, because if you know what trend you're in and the direction the market's in, then and, and, and you can actually um, track the lengths of these different patterns, then you can trade the market quite successfully. The market does not run on events. So many people think that it runs on events. It does not run on events. It runs in a, in a predetermined manner. And if you understand the manner that it runs in, then you and you know what pattern you're in, because some of these waves have different patterns, like like these corrective waves. There are a number of patterns they can be in, like triangles. We call f some of them flats. Uh, we can actually have ending diagonals as another one. And uh, let's see, I'm missing one. Triangles, flats, oh, and zigzags. And if you understand the different patterns and you can identify them, then you know what the market's going to do next. And so it's a, I think it's a, it's a science. And a lot of people uh, don't understand how it works, but that's kind of a little synopsis. Now, this runs through society as well. So it's, it's interesting that you can look at uh, these trends and see them throughout uh, the environment that we live in. So this is a chart on smoking that I found, and this goes to 1900, shows the beginning of when people started to smoke. And you can see that the smoking number of people, um, this, is, this is actually in cigarettes per year that were sold, that's how they, how they measured it. First wave, second wave, here's the fractal th third wave, one, two, three, four, five. I should have a little, a little Roman numeral there under the three, but there wasn't room. Three, four, and five. So we have five waves up, and then once you have five waves, then it retraces. This was only five waves, and so it is going. It is basically over. Once this was done, it was over. So it's interesting that um, you can. It, 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 it's difficult to sort of time this, but you can see when you get into a third wave and you have a fourth that you know you're only going to get one more. And if you were very careful, you could actually see within these, like the one, two, three, four, five. So it's interesting. And down in here, there's actually five waves within that first wave. So that is looking at part of it in society. And of course, we had this coronavirus. And one of the things that I did was I looked at the pattern in the coronavirus with all of the deaths. So these are actually new cases. But this is a one, two, and you can see the five waves here. Uh, subwaves, we call them, which are 
or uh, the sub the um, sorry fractal waves, and then you got a third wave and a fourth wave and a fifth wave, and then of course it's just died off. And most of these have to do with deaths, and so people are talking about a second wave. Well, there is no second wave. That's just, you don't find the second wave. After you get five waves in society, it turns around and goes right back down to zero. And so there's an awful lot of BS and a lot of the stuff you're hearing out there, and you probably know that, that none of this is real. And, and the coronavirus is, oh, was over months ago. Um, you know, there's still a little bit of it around, but they have tests that don't work. And, you know, it's... Um, anyway, I don't I want to get on to that subject. But here's um, COVID-19 in Washington State. And these are confirmed cases. And you can see one, two, three up in here. And there were five subwaves. And then we have a four and a five. And then, of course, it starts to go down. And typically, these go down in an A, B, C kind of structure. And it went right down to pretty well zero here in Washington state. And then you're going to get maybe another little wave up, but you're not going to get another set of five waves up with this. It's really just going to um, move along and uh, eventually go down to nothing. So that was a kind of an interesting exercise in terms of looking at, you know, the five waves in, an, in, in a trend. Now, there's something else that's very important. There's the wave structure to how the market moves. You can count waves. The other thing is you can measure the waves. And there's something known as the Fibonacci golden mean. And that number is 1.618 or 162% or uh, 62%. Anything with the 62% level in it is something that we use all through the market because for virtually every, we call them waves within the market, has a relationship to the golden mean. So why is that? Well, I talked about cycles in my cycles, uh, my cycles, introduction to cycles, what did I call it? The um, um, part one cycles, I can't remember even the title of it, but it's on, on my uh, site and you can look at that. But cycles come from the planets because the 172 year planet is actually the conjunction of Neptune and Uranus at 171.4 years. So every time those two conjunct, they get close together in a lineup, we always, 14 years later, you get a depression and a stock market crash. And the last three times, uh, that's exactly what has happened. The only problem with going back further than that, it has to be something to do with grain. or And, and you can find that is that the economy just goes into the tank every 172 years. But we've only had the stock market around since about the 1700s. So you can't really use that earlier than that. But we know in the last three times, it has been 14 years after the conjunction that we always get a depression. So the conjunction was, uh, I think it was 1993. And if you had 14 years, you'll get 2007. And we started, remember the depression that we, or the recession that we had. Uh, and then, of course, in 2007, the central bankers plugged in all of this money into the market and, and kept it up for one more wave. And we're going to go look at that. But where does this come from? <clears throat> this number, <coughs> excuse me, within the within the solar system, because here are all our planets. And so let's go look at that. So if you take Mercury and you figure that as one, and then you took the ratios of the distance between the different planets, and you can see them all here, you could then take those one, two, sorry, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and you can divide by ten, and lo and behold, here's what you get as the average, 1.1618, which is uh, sorry, that should be 1.618. I've got an error on that slide. That's interesting. So it's 1.618 or 618. And we also use the reciprocal of 38%, 382. So if you understand your math, that's the reciprocal. You add those two numbers together and they add up to one. And so, you know, I want you to think about this is the market, what that tells you is that the stock market is actually influenced by the movement of the planets. And you can take that a step further. And we know that people go crazy when there's a full moon. So that is we're obviously influenced psychologically by the full moon. 
And you can take that another step further and you can say, well, there are obviously influences by the planets because it's not that the planets are moving the stock market, but the planets are are influencing how people feel on any particular day and they will uh, plug their money into the market or not and this thing just revolves over and over and over again and so a lot of these waves will have that measurement of 6.618 or 1.618 so it's fascinating and you find out that the world has an awful lot more mother nature in it than you ever would have realized so what is this Fibonacci sequence well you can write it down and figure it out yourself it's super easy and here are the sort of two numbers that are in the stock market that's called the golden mean and how it works is you start with a with the number zero and then you put down a one and then you add these two together to get the next number so zero plus one equals one then one plus one equals two one plus two equals three three plus sorry two plus three equals five and so on and so on once you get up to around the number 13 you can take eight and you can divide 13 into 8 and you will get this number right there all right and that's true with all of the other numbers all the way up there are a lot of other magical things that happen with these numbers as well but it's all throughout society and you can find it in music for example so for example here's here's a triad a chord a basic chord c e g and that's the number 3 and normally a full chord is, is five notes, and then you have an octave, which is eight notes. So it's interesting, and one, two, three, four, five black keys. So all of these numbers are in music, and they're in an awful lot of other places as well. You'll actually find that our body has got measurements that are based on Fibonacci numbers. It's in our DNA, and you can measure the DNA, there's this, the relationships, and the Parthenon, way back when in Greece, had 3. Uh, 0.382 for the, um, from sort of the ceiling to the top here, and then this lower portion was 618. It tends to be a, a very pleasing uh, relationship to look at in art and any artist knows all about uh, the golden mean and there's an awful lot more things all through nature and you can go you know google uh, fibonacci i'm sure they haven't taken that off yet <laughs> uh, i won't get into that subject but it's getting harder and harder to keep these things up anyway that's um so you've got the two things going in elliott wave you've got the wave structure which is again five and that's the trend and three which is a counter trend and that goes back to your Fibonacci numbers so that's all through the market as well and the waves have relationships uh, based on the golden mean and it's reciprocal all right so I just wanted to, sh to share that with you and give you an idea of how the market moves and how you can trade it now this is looking at the Dow this is a linear scale or an, an arithmetic um, arithmetic chart so it really just shows the raw numbers as they go up and so what you're the dow is the not the largest index but it's part of the new york stock exchange it's another index it only has 30 stocks in it but they tend to be the largest stocks in the entire exchange the new york stock exchange and there are other indexes that have other groups of stocks within them but a lot of people watch the dow and it was the first index that was developed way back when in the 1700s so we have a lot of data on that so that's the easiest one to look at here's 1929 now you can't see much from this because it's a, an arithmetic scale and we were only talking about numbers in the 500s there whereas today we're up around 30,000. so this is the market that you're looking at today and you know there's been a lot of discussion as to is this a bubble or not um, you look at the arithmetic scale and <laughs> I don't think there's any question that this is a bubble we've had 52 percent rise in this which is inflation 5200 percent from 19 from 1974 up until where we are today and here was 2007 which was our top and you're going to see on another chart that this this was the end of five waves and then we came down and right about 2009 that's when the central bankers plugged in that one trillion dollars I think it was about uh, 800 billion and that is what has kept the market up with a lot more because they put in some other 
uh, injections of cash throughout this section, and now we've got a market that is up much higher. But this is an extra wave, what is called a B wave, and it's corrective, and it's right at the point where it's going to start to come down. So this is, I call this the largest bubble ever. Uh, you've also at the same time got debt all over the world. We have more debt than we've ever had uh, before in history and bubbles always burst. So we're at the point where this is going to come down and that is the challenge we have. We've got all of this corruption at this cycle top that we're in 2007 and these weak leaders and authoritarianism and it's all going to crumble because the biggest challenge we have is the financial system is going to melt down and that's the challenge that nobody's really talking about right now but it has always been there on the horizon and it's going to be more important it's going to be more important as we go forward here so let's go look at this another way let's go look at this in a log scale which spread this, spreads this out so that the larger numbers have an equal weighting to these smaller numbers down here so that you can actually see the pattern a lot clearer. And here it is. This is the same chart as 5,200% rise from 1974 right here until about 2000. Well, where we are now, it's not going to change much from 2020 to 2021. But here's 1929, so now you can see the big crash that they had in 1929. And then from there, we had one, two, three, four, five waves up to 2007. All right, so there's your five waves. Each of these waves, you can see the first wave here, three waves down, that was a corrective wave. And then within these waves, you would be able to pick out one, two, three, four, five, and they all have measurements. For example, you could measure this first wave and from the bottom of the second wave to the top of the third wave is, is 2.618 times the first wave. So there's that 618 number again, the golden mean. And the same thing here, this is a multiple of that golden mean for this, this other uh, measurement that takes us right up to 2007. One of the things that happens with once you get finished with five waves, as I mentioned earlier, once you get finished, you always revert back to the previous fourth wave, which is down here in 1974 when the market was at $570. So once we top, that's where we're going. Now, I just think about that. I think that's going to be in about 2026. So that's where I'm talking about the seven year period. Uh, but it will come down in three waves because it's going to be a corrective wave. And here from 2009 up to where we are today is this B wave that in actual fact, uh, Elliot said, Ralph Elliot said that that could happen in a market, whereas Prechter made his own decisions and said, no, that could never happen in a market. Well, here we are with a B wave and it is really a man-made wave created by these central bankers and it has just created a horrendous problem in that we could have had a crash here and been done by now because this was 2007, 2009, give it about five years, it would have taken us through 2015 and we would be in the recovery stage but you know it's it's made it so much worse and people are more destitute nobody has any money there's more inflation and what happens with inflation of course <clears throat> excuse me is that it takes the value out of the money so a hundred years ago back in you know early 1900s when the fed was created in 1913 we had a dollar that was worth a hundred cents up here with the inflation our dollar now is worth four cents whether it's the U.S. or it's Canada or whatever, uh, it's, it doesn't buy anything anymore. That's why houses are so expensive because you're paying for them in four cent dollars. So one of the things you need to realize is you need to understand deflation because when this wave comes down, that's going to be deflationary and our money will start to go up in value. And in five, seven years, homes are going to be down around 15% of their value that they're at right now. That's what happened in 1929 to 1933. Same thing, uh, deflation, and it took houses down uh, dramatically and now they're all the way back up and our money is uh, worthless again. So 
that there's a big story behind that which i won't go into but that's one of the things you want to to learn to understand because it's a good thing if you have money and cash going forward then you will be rich because it's going to go up in value and homes are going to go down in value so in 10 years in 10 years seven years you're going to be able to buy a home that's maybe a, <clears throat> excuse me a million dollars now for <clears throat> excuse me a hundred and fifty thousand dollars and so that's a boon for anybody that's got cash. So our economy is going to change and, uh, you know, you're going to be a part of that. And uh, so there's some good things. There are some bad things. And it's going to clean out all of the 1%. We got to, this, this the, the, the situation we're in right now is a situation where good is fighting evil. It's the 1% against the 99%. This has happened over and over again in history. So it would have happened a thousand years ago. It happened at the top of Rome. It happened at the top of the English Empire. Uh, so many, many times in history, the same thing has happened, and we're going through it again. And it all comes from the money lenders, the central bankers, and this fiat currency. And so there's no other way to get out of this. Uh, there is one other way, and I'm going to comment on that at the end here, and we'll see what happens. But usually this plays out, good old Mother Nature. And then at the bottom of it, typically the currency might change and, and things might happen. But it's going to be, we're going to have a lot of chaos, and, and this breeds civil wars. You know, I've talked about that in the uh, Cycles of History video, uh, what happens at the same time that the market comes down. So not a good picture, but if you're prepared for it, and you know it's coming, and you understand deflation and some of the other things that are going to happen, you'll be okay, all right? So it's going to end up being a much better world when it's all over because we will have got rid of all of the bad people and the corruption. That's what always happens. All of the truth always comes out at these cycle tops, and you're finding that that is happening more and more today, that you're finding more and more truth coming out. And it's going to continue like that for a little while longer. So this is looking at um, the market. Uh, I can't remember what this is. This is a nine-day chart. So the one that I had showed you, this one back here, is actually a quarter chart. So every uh, three months, uh, each of these waves is three months, these little waves in here. Not this thing, but each of these little ticks in here is about three months, whereas this one, it's nine days. So this is looking at 2007, which is what we would call the theoretical top of the cycle. And this was the top of the fifth wave. And then we came down in three waves. It looks like five, but if you actually measure it and you count the waves, uh, you will find that it's actually three waves. Three waves here, one, two, and then five waves within the C wave. Um, makes the entire thing um, three waves down. And then we got a wave up here, but it doesn't have a valid second wave to it. So there's a reason that you would call this corrective, and it measures as a corrective wave as well. So I can measure and from this point um, up here, and I get a measurement, an extension off this first wave. In any rate, this is a corrective wave, and we're now at a top. And you can see the fractal elements of this. So you've got a, a, a white, one, two, three, four, five. That's the big picture. And once we reach five, then it's going to collapse. And you've got a fractal uh, smaller set of waves within that big third wave. One, two, three, four, five takes us to the white third wave. All right. And then you have another fractal. One, two, three, four, five takes us to the top of the blue wave. So there's the fractal part of it. And now we have what we call, uh, this is a, called actually a, um, a broadening top, or some people call it a megaphone pattern. But once you get to this pattern, it spells the end, and you end up having this set of waves that goes up and down before you hit the final wave, and it's going to head to the bottom here. So this is our B wave that we're kind of stuck with, and there is no way out of this. We've done most of the ups and downs. We're just about to, in the next month, month and a half, two months, we're going to have another great big wave down, about 2,000 points in the S&P 500, about 10,000 points in the Dow. And then we're going to have one more wave up to a final high. And I think that is probably going to be late 2021. So there's about a year to prepare for what's coming. 
and then we're going to have a great big wave to the downside. All right, and that's going to go down to uh, you know the 570. I would say under a thousand dollars. So up here we're at around. Um, this is the S&P 500, so this is not the Dow anymore, but they look pretty well the same. In the S&P 500, this will get down eventually uh, under 200 points. Uh, in the Dow, it's going to get down under about 3,000 points, which is, you know, 10% of what it is now. In the Dow, it's up at around 30,000 now. It's going to get down to around um, under 3,000, so you can imagine what it's going to be like. There aren't going to be an awful lot of functioning businesses on a grand scale. So it's really going to be, going to be a situation of being prepared for what's coming. And uh, so I have a site that um, helps people uh, get through that. And I, I do a newsletter every month and tell people what's actually happening. Right now, it's mostly about this election going on in the United States. But that is really an election that it's a, a cyber war from uh, other countries around the world that have interfered in the U.S. election, and there's going to be consequences to be paid for that, and it's going to be interesting to see how that all plays out. But the bigger picture is where the market is going. But all of these things, the corruption, uh, things falling apart, you always get at the tops of these 1,000 or 500-year cycles, and that's where we're at. Now, I want to show you, um, you know, if, if, you, if you said, hey, this doesn't look like it, you know, would it go up any higher? There are other um, patterns that I want to show you. This, this shows me that we have one wave down to go and one wave up to go, and then we're going to come down. If I go look at the New York Stock Exchange, this is the same nine-day pattern that, that I showed you. Whoops, I went one ahead. One-day pattern I'm showing you. Or sorry, this is the nine-day um, the nine day, what would I call that, um, time frame that uh, I'm going to show you the next slide is in. We have one more down, one wave down and one wave up to go, and then we come down. If I go over here and look at the Dow in it as a quarter, oh, that's the wrong chart. I'm going in the wrong direction. Here we go. Here is the New York Stock Exchange. So this is the mother exchange. The Dow and the S&P 500 are sub indices of this larger exchange. Here's 2007, here's 2009. This came down in three waves. And what we are looking at right now is a pattern. It went right back up again, but this pattern is very corrective and we call it an ending pattern. It's an ending diagonal. And when you see this pattern, you know that the market is just about done. So this reinforces my other charts that I've shown you saying we have one more wave down and one more wave up and then we're going to come down. Ending diagonals are always in five waves. So you always have um, a first wave up here. This is the first wave coming up to the top. Then you have a second wave. Then you have a third wave and then you have a fourth wave. All these waves have to be in threes. All right, so this one, you would number this a little bit differently, but this is an A, B, C wave that I'm expecting, and then I'm expecting one more wave up to a final high and then a wave to the downside. You can see we have uh, little indicators and things that show the divergence of this that shows that this is, uh, this is a relative strength. So it means that the strength of these waves up here is starting to wane and it's going to start to come down here very, very soon. But that's a look at what we're seeing in the overall exchange. So that says that we're very, get, getting very close to an end. Here is the same thing in the Toronto Stock Exchange, 2007, 2009. We have the same pattern as an ending diagonal. And once the ending diagonal is done, <clears throat> then it will come down um, pretty hard to our ending. So it also says that we have one wave down and one wave up to go. So these waves all need to be in threes. This was a single A wave. This was a single B wave. We need a C wave down. And then we will actually, this last wave will also be in three waves. I just, I'm not showing it here. And then that will come down. You can see there's not as much divergence here in our indicator. This is the RSI indicator, but still is there a fair amount of um, of divergence. So that's sort of looking at Elliott Wave and the market on a grand scale and giving you an idea 
of what I'm seeing happening going forward. Now, at the same time that's happening, we could look at also the dollar because the dollar is a key element when you talk about inflation and deflation. This is a one, this is a weekly chart. So each of these little bars in here are one week. So this goes from the top of 2000, or the top of the market in 2008, which was the top of a third wave. The dollar, US dollar, moves in the opposite direction. And what this is telling me right now is we may actually get a double bottom here, or it may come down, but this wave is corrective to the downside. This has done five waves to the upside. So if this does a double bottom, then this would make this entire thing corrective. In any case, this next move is to the, oops, is to the upside here. And once this finishes to the downside, so the U.S. markets, the U.S. indices, the equities are going to come down at the same time the dollar goes up, which also means that gold is going to go down. So it's going to be an interesting situation. But this is deflationary because the dollar is actually going to go up in value. All right. And so that's one of the ways that I know we're going into a deflationary environment. The other thing is that when you have a depression, we have never had a depression in history that has been anything but deflationary. All of these credit defla credit credit based um, because we've got way too much way too much debt. So that's a credit based de depression. They're all deflationary. So uh, your money starts to go in the other direction. It's a fiat. Fiat money, it's not based on gold, uh, and it's going to move to the upside. So that's what I'm seeing there. So this is the weekly. If I go and look at a monthly chart, this is going back and looking much further, and it shows you, this is the, the, the wave structure I just showed you, this little section here, where you can see five waves up and then three waves down. So what we have here is the bottom in 2000 and about 2009, 2008, and then it has started up as an A wave and then three waves down a B wave, so that's corrective. And then you've got five waves up and that would be an A wave to what I um, think is going to be a zigzag. So a zigzag is five waves up, three waves down, and then another five waves. And that looks like it's what we're going to get. So I would suggest we're going to see the dollar come down a little bit lower here. And here's our 62% retrace. So if, if you know Elliott Wave, you know that in most cases you get a 62% retrace. Again, that's your 618 uh, level. And you would be able to measure all of these waves and you would get that same sort of relationship between some of these waves. 62% and that should then turn to the upside and that will be, so it's inflation on the way down, deflation on the way up. And that also reinforces the point that we should be seeing a deflationary environment going forward. Here's just a quick, uh, a more zoomed in look at that. Uh, not really much else I want to tell you. This is the A, B and looking for a C wave to the upside. So all of this has been caused, this debacle that we've got by the money lenders and they're the central bankers of Europe and they've got their hooks into everybody. In the US, they really uh, own the Federal Reserve in Canada. They got into our central bank here in Canada and we have to get all of our money from the central bankers where before 1974, we got all of our money. We created our own money in Canada, uh, but now we uh, get it from the central bankers for no good reason and we pay them, in 2012, we paid them a trillion dollars of interest, for example, and that's money that goes out of our economy. And, and so this is what is going on, is that if this, and, the, and they're getting scared, these central bankers, because we have so much debt and the market's getting very near a top, and if that all craters, that's the end of the central bankers. And as far as I'm concerned, it's way too, I mean, we should have, we should have had this happen a lot longer ago, and I think there's going to be a move here in the next little while, and I think you're going to see it in the U.S. to make sure that this thing ends. And uh, the one thing that could happen is that if they end up tying the U.S. dollar to gold or something, it may change that trajectory of the great big uh, depressionary move to the downside. That's the one thing I think that could change it. 
and we'll see how this all pans out. But the Bank of International Settle Settlements have a building in Switzerland that nobody can get into. They have their own laws around this thing. They are absolutely untouchable. The only way that we're going to get rid of these guys, which are, are really the evil in our society, it's the greed, is to uh, either tie the dollar and other currencies to gold, which usually happens at the bottom of a crash, or like it did in, in the 1930s, they had the crash in 1929, I think it was 1933 that they tied uh, gold to the dollar. I might be wrong there on the date, but it, but it was certainly after they had the big crash, and it may be the same thing that happens here. This is the Federal Reserve, of course, and you probably know that it's a private bank. It doesn't have anything to do with the federal or the government, and so we get, in the U.S., they get their money from a private bank that does the same sort of thing. So, you know, there's a call to end the Fed, and for good reason. And, of course, we've got on the other side, we've got this World Economic Forum right now, where these oligarchs, and these are the people that meet in Davos every year, and they're the 1%. And, of course, this is what happens. The French Revolution, I mean, you can go right back through history, is the 1% always want to keep everything the way it is, and the 99% have no money. They're the serfs. They're the people like us. And there is always a great big starts with civil wars and then a huge revolution where everything gets overthrown. And I think that's what we're going to go through one way or the other. I don't think there's an easy way out of that, except that in the early 1600s, there was a revolution called the Glorious Revolution where there was no blood, bloodshed, but it was at the same time in history relative to where we are. It was at the top of the English uh, Empire with the end of Queen Elizabeth, and about 50 years later, they ended up having this revolution. Anyway, it's the same pattern going over and over again in cycles. It's the same pattern that goes over and over again in the uh, in the in cycles on, on a grander scale. So that's what we're dealing with, and we're going to see how this thing all pans out. It's certainly an interesting time to be alive, but you need to make sure that you know where things are going and stay on top of it as this thing moves through the ups and downs of the stock market. The only fly in the ointment is if gold, if they tie the U.S. dollar, which is the reserve currency, to gold. And, and that would, because we have a fiat currency right now, and that's why we have these wild swings in the market. The fiat currency means, it, you can go Google that word, but it means that uh, it's not tied to anything. So you can't, in, 19, in 1929, you used to be able to take your money into the bank and get gold for your money. Actually, until 1971, until Nixon actually delinked gold from the dollar, you could actually go into a bank and, and get gold. Uh, $35 worth of gold for uh, $35. Now you can't do that. Uh, and they have delinked gold from the dollar, so it just means it's floating. It's not really, it's worth what you think it is. It's not worth any sort of pegged amount. And so that is one of the issues that uh, is always a bad idea. Fiat currencies always fail. They always end up with these wild speculations and these great big bubbles, and then everything crashes. So it's the same thing over and over again, and this takes us back to our cycles. And so we are at a point now we're at the top of this cycle and we're going to have a cycle that is getting colder and drier you always when you have a depression you always have colder and drier like in the 1970s it was a cold and dry period for about 10 years late 60s to about 1980 and we had Nixon and, and wars and and uh, we had a recession during those years and so you always have that as the climate turns cold and dry and you always have empires that uh, dissolve. And it's interesting that if you were to go through all of this, every 500 years, you have the empire of the day moves from the east to the west and then back again. So the next big empire will be China, which you're already seeing it, you know, making waves, but it's too early for China. Uh, so, you know, they will get hit with this great big depression as well. And then things will all start over, but they will be probably the next big superpower in 172 years. That tends to be how these things move, or they may be at the top of another uh, large, um, in a thousand years, maybe a thousand years, they will be the 
um, the major empire. It takes that long for these things to build up. So we'll see how this all plays out, but that's how the stock market works. The stock market is much more predictable than these cycles are on a larger scale. So that's how you can use the same kind of thinking about the market because it really is mother nature. It is the planets and the solar system that define what happens on earth. And it will give you an idea as to when to buy a house. Now is not the time to buy a house. Now is the time to sell a house and rent for the next seven years. And, uh, and at the end of that, you're going to be able to buy a house for an awful lot less than you can buy it today. Anyway, I have a site, a couple of sites that give you a lot more information. WorldCyclesInstitute.com. You'll find lots of good articles there and information about the market. And the Truth Sage is all about thriving in the new economy. That's a, a site where you can purchase a subscription and I put out a video and a newsletter and lots of information within the site as to how to stay safe. Safe. It goes through you know health and what's going to be happening with health in the future. Uh, it talks a lot about money. It has a little video in there, a little video. It's quite extensive and I'm going to be doing more on that which teaches you about deflation and the things that you need to do. So it's got lists and all of that good stuff. So I suggest you go take a look at both of those, but there's an awful lot more uh, articles for free on worldcycles.com about the things that are happening now. Thank you very much for being here. It'd be great if you thought this was worthwhile. It'd be great if you would like it, uh, you know, on the, uh, on the link in uh, YouTube and uh, subscribe to my site. There's going to be more of these coming out. I'm working on part two of... Uh, history of cycles, which will take you through a little bit of this, but it's going to spend an awful lot more, more time on some of the traits and the things that you're going to see in the future as a lot of this stuff unfolds. So stay safe out there. We are in certainly trying times, but it's one of the more interesting times in history, and you'll learn a lot now that you can pass down to your kids in the future. And the world is going to change very much for the better uh, over the next you know, 10 to 20 years, you're going to see major changes and we're going to get rid of all of this authoritarianism and all the bad stuff that's happening right now. And we're going to get rid of all the corruption. It always gets washed out at the tops of these cycles. But we have a period in the next 10 to 15 years where things are going to be a lot tougher than they have been in the past. And you can thank the central bankers for all of it.